it's like a it's like a hospital gown kind of yeah he's in his hospital gown still um so you get some funny shots of his butt <laughs> I was like, oh, that was butt. all the rage in the 2000s man <laughs> it really was <laughs> Welcome back to the Great American Movie Review, where we review great American movies. My name is Micaiah. And I'm Kyle. This is a Movie of the Week style podcast where we take turns picking films and we have a casual discussion about their context and quality. This week was my turn, so I picked the 2008 romantic comedy Yes Man. This is primarily an audio show, so you can also find us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts if you prefer to take us on the go. Be sure to subscribe to us there. And yeah, we're mobile. So Yes Man follows a recluse bank loan uh, operator named Carl Allen, who's played by Jim Carrey, the one and only. And he tries to turn his life around after hearing a seminar with a man who challenges him and makes a covenant with him to only say the word yes when he responds to a question. Or whenever there is a demand thrown his way, he must agree to it. And as always shenanigans is in sale. yes <laughs> very much in that kind of uh liar liar or to some extent bruce almighty kind of mode yeah of... i consider this part of like a an unofficial anthology with the mask liar liar bruce almighty and this it's like that that concept comedy where it's jim carrey and he's either down on his luck or his life couldn't be or his life isn't as good as it could be and then something changes his perspective and then the entire plot happens based on that thing. He's he's wound up in the first 10 minutes and then let loose. Right. Right. Um, but the film was directed by Peyton Reed based on the memoir from Danny Wallace. It was a moderate success with a $223 million take on the film's surprisingly high $70 million budget. I do know this off the top of my head for no reason at all. Uh, Bruce Almighty was a very high budget film as well for like yeah. 2003 i think it came out or 2005 that had like an 80 million dollar budget so right. jim carrey was basically just thrown money especially after 1994 when he made upwards of like about a billion dollars from well, three movies in the 90s and the 2000s you just had these star-led comedies like these big studio comedy vehicles that you just don't see get made anymore and it's interesting though that like so much there was so much faith in these movies led by specific stars whether it be jim carrey sometimes you you'll see like jack black um maybe a, a bill murray you know these these yeah. star-led comedy vehicles really through the 80s and 90s and the 2000s was really the last kind of gasp of that with people like jim carrey so the 80s had that, especially with Disney being the forerunner for those kind of like Bill Cosby-esque comedies where it was just a, a star from the 80s just put into a situation with a new director, new writers, that kind of thing. Yeah, like but Eddie Murphy was in so many different Eddie Murphy movies. was in yeah. <laughs> very, a, a great many with Dan Aykroyd specifically right. somehow. It's and I mean, Jim Carrey, Jim Carrey in the late 90s, early 2000s was probably one of the biggest contributors to the box office. Just in no general, matter what period. he was in, yeah. yeah, exactly. So anybody, any any studio was gonna throw any kind of movie his way, right? But you can see it kind of waning in the late two thousands with movies like this, where definitely it, it's still profitable, and I'm sure it made money later because I'm this is probably a big home video seller. <laughs> um, you can attest to that. Yes, I had it on DVD growing up. I've watched this movie probably five or six times, if not maybe a few more times even than that. I don't know, but yeah, it's still like making 223 million dollars as a comedy is a great take but it's high production budget like it's actual box office returns were not that substantial yeah for what it is but and it's probably still, not what the studio wanted yeah or what the studio was expecting given throwing 70 million at at uh a relatively new uh director i think peyton reed i've of course we both you and i have seen the ant-man trilogy which he's directed all three i think right two but, for three on those i'd say yeah yeah i like the first I, two ant-man movies quite a bit i was gonna say one, i'm actually a pretty big defender of the first two a, a lot yeah. of people especially mcu fans write them off as just like the worst that the mcu had seen especially no, up a lot until of fun. Like 2018 when ant-man and the wasp came out but 
Like, yeah, they are a lot of fun. They're 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 actually closer to a romantic comedy than I would consider like most of the other uh, Avengers movies or MCU Yeah, they're movies. just kind of light and it's when you're watching them in order to it's nice to hit the Ant-Man movies after like the big event films. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it's also nice to to have the best one first, then the second best and then you don't have to watch the third one. <laughs> it's yeah. it's so nice. Quantum Mania, <laughs> we can just I don't think Peyton Reed was ready for that, but I think Peyton Reed is like a good comedy director. Uh, specifically, I, I personally, I love Bring It On. <laughs> I know it's considered like a chick flick, I say in quotes. But... I haven't seen that, but I have seen The Breakup. And I, I remember like enjoying that, even if I don't remember much yeah. from it. And so... Down With Love has a big cult following. A lot of people really love that film. I haven't seen that one, though. But I think that Peyton Reed's a solid comedy director. Um, I agree. I, I just don't think he was ready for something like to the extent of what Quantum Mania was versus the other Ant Man movies. Yeah, it was so. kind of nice. Like, obviously, because it's Ant Man and Ant Man and the Wasp, uh, those are low stakes or low. Right. Like, you can you could skip over those and you wouldn't miss much when it came to the MCU. So it was it was a it was a very good deal that he got basically directing the safest movies that you could direct in the MCU. Right. They're low stress. So uh, I did want to point out, uh, I believe his name is Nicholas Stoller, is one of the screenwriters for Yes Man. Mm -hmm. And he directed what I believe to be one of the best romantic comedies, uh, Forgetting Sarah Marshall. Oh, yeah. I mean, Nicholas Stoller is one of these guys. His name's been around in like comedy stuff. I mean, he's worked on stuff that's really great and stuff that's not so great. Um, He wrote specifically one. I think my favorite movie that he wrote is the 2011 Muppet movie with Jason Segel. Oh, Jason Segel. I yeah. love that movie. Uh, so, <laughs> But yeah, no, like I think with comedy writing, too, like you can write a great comedy script, but comedy, a lot of it is made in the moment. So whether or not a movie is great based on a you know what could be a great comedy script is going to be up to the stars the filmmakers even the editing is going to determine like kind of if those jokes work on screen well i think another thing is uh nicholas Storr, i believe wrote uh what why am i forgetting this on the spot uh the other uh jim carrey movie from the 2000s um comedy specifically uh Almighty? no well, that's from the 2000s, so I don't know. Um, fun with Dick and Jane? Yeah, Fun with Dick and Jane. Thank you. Uh, he he wrote that as well. So he he has written for specifically a Jim Carrey comedy, which is a genre on its own. Um, he's, he's written that as well. But uh, you bring up like comedies are mostly, I, I would agree that comedies, the m m highest portion of responsibility for comedies are on the actors, I think, first, and then right. the director's second. And then the right. writer's third. Unless but, you're like an, a director like the Coen brothers or an Edgar Wright or a Tarantino, which Tarantino's com his movies all have comedy in them. But those are writer directors. And so they're in full right. control of what's written and then how they translate it to screen. That's a completely different thing when it comes to comedy writing. And but specifically, like when for, uh, specifically for Edgar Wright, I mean, Simon Pegg helped him write the Cornetto trilogy. So right. even the star of the show was also writing in it and had a had a hand in the production at probably right. as much as edgar wright right so and but this was this, one of those blacklist scripts that a studio picked up right because every year the hollywood blacklist comes out which if you don't know what that is it's just a bunch of scripts that these are that some group some body has determined it these are the most or these are the best scripts that haven't been produced yet is basically right. what the blacklist is. So this was on the blacklist for 2007. And then they, I guess it immediately got picked up by Warner brothers. And then they hired Peyton Reed, who at that well, point, Danny Wallace's, established himself. Danny Wallace's memoir is an interesting one. I haven't read it, but I, I knew that especially when this movie came out, it was pretty popular with, especially right. uh, given that he's a British journalist. Um, it's it's an interesting case to turn your life around entirely, even if it doesn't need to, to turn your life around entirely and say yes to everything. Yeah. So traveling the world without wanting to or learning and in the movie's case, learning Korean and guitar because you just find a piece of paper that says, do you want guitar lessons? Right. So he it's not the inkling or wanting to. It's the 
happenstance to find yourself in that situation. And then eventually you'll d discuss in your mind whether you still want to do that thing or if you're trying to distance yourself, you can do that without saying no. It right. can be like a maybe kind of thing, which is the that's the message of the movie. It, it's a very obvious message that that's what the movie's leading to, but I still think it's an interesting conversation and definitely like the original memoir. I once again I haven't read that either, but it's I understand why that would be enough here for like a good concept comedy such as this. It also is somehow even if it had just been like a documentary on David Wallace's like a a reenactment or like interviewing him and like dramatizing it, it still would have been an interesting conversation akin to like one of those motivational books that you find. Yeah. Because it's got something that everyone kind of needs to know. It's very dramatized in it in and of itself somehow. You don't really need to do much. And it's it's very easy to get along with. Yeah, which is that's kind of the whole point. If you're saying yes to everything, then you're going to end up doing some interesting things. Yep. So, which is kind of why, like, I actually thought of this movie a couple weeks ago, <laughs> just because I was like, I got to stop saying no to everything because it's just like in my instinct. It's my, like something got broken in me a long time ago where my default answer to anything is just like, no, 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 I don't want to do that. If anybody asks me a yes or no question. Anytime so anybody like, asks you something, you just look at Elrond like a Sildor and says, no. <laughs> right, right. So I was like, Destroy I got to break out of that habit, habit. And I just thought of this movie <laughs> randomly. And then sure enough, here we are talking about it on the episode. Yeah. So the reason I picked this movie, we can get into that now. Um, I think this is fate telling you to think about it more. <laughs> um, so I picked this movie because I wanted to start an interesting thing where I go onto a random movie generator website and pick a random movie. And whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether we enjoy it, whether we don't, we'll talk about it. So it somehow came up with Yes Man, a movie that not only both of us had seen, but both of us enjoy and both of us have like a deep history with. So, Yeah. Yeah, this movie, like, it came out to pretty lukewarm response critically, which, you know, comedies historically, like, especially broad comedies like this, generally haven't gotten, like, they rarely get really strong critical response in this kind of capacity. Yes. And they're made for general audiences is ultimately what it comes down to. And I think in the case of this one, I think that the general audiences, while they were also somewhat lukewarm on it did embrace it more and i think over the years like i don't know it kind of has people don't really talk about this one that much among jim carrey's like <laughs> i would and i would absolutely agree with that because he hasn't even done this type of comedy like he's done this type of comedy better on multiple occasions right i'd, I'd put liar liar and bruce almighty and the yes. mask which is it's a vague it's a stretch but i I see those similarities. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree that those those three are all better than this, um, both in, I think, idea and execution. And also his specific take on the character that he's right. portraying, because it's it's an interesting take. This is his most like depressed kind of character, especially in the beginning. But right. and like I said, he's wound up and then let loose. But he and I'll agree for one of the handful of times with Roger Ebert um, who says, let me pull up the quote because I, I read it after I'd watched the movie again, he compared it to liar liar. And he said, quote, Jim Carrey works the premise for all it's worth, but it doesn't allow him to bust loose and fly. And I agree yeah. with that wholeheartedly. Yeah. I, I think that, I think that Jim Carrey is the highlight of the movie with Zoe Deschanel. I think that yeah. Jim Carrey and his relationship with her character and his, his take on the whole thing is good. But it feels like it's. It feels like there's something missing. It yeah. feels like you, the pacing's just off enough to where it doesn't fully realize the idea of saying yes to everything. Right, right. It's not very nuanced for sure. It has an obvious kind of moral objective, and it's kind of beelining it to that. Um, but I do think that there's still a lot of fun to be had in this film, like mostly through Carrie's performance, but mostly through the comedy of it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's just, two... it's oh, very sorry. light. Like the whole film is very light. It's breezy. It goes by fast. Um, <laughs> it just kind of like, it doesn't, 
it's not it's not like a great film, but it's something it's an easy watch. Yeah. I guess is what and, I'll say. And I agree. I the point I was gonna bring up as well is uh so the movies that I thought of when I heard or when I read Roger Ebert's quote was wow, that's exactly like Limitless and Lucy, which I assume you know both of those movies. Yes, it's about I've seen Limitless, releasing, but I've not seen Lucy. Yeah. It, it's kind of the similar vein. It's like the sci-fi version of, of Limitless, where Limitless is like that kind of concept drama kind of thing. Right. But it's a bit like this, where it's like unleashing the 10% of your brain into like 100% of its capabilities, which is a myth, by the way. We use 100% of our brains, just not all at the time, all, right. all at once. So that's the myth that if anybody tells you you need to use more than 10% of your brain, that it's stupid. But Limitless and Lucy do that exact same thing and like have different genres, but of that same idea. And they both could have been so much better, but both of them very much fall flat on the execution of the ideas. Right, right. I yeah, I agree completely. Like it's you have a single idea and you try to stretch it as far as you can, but you still have to craft like a good narrative in there too. And that's where I think movies like that kind of drop the ball. And this one to some extent as well. I think it just doesn't go far enough. Yeah, you described it as a romantic comedy, which it kind of is because it's tongue it, in cheek because it's more it's more so a romantic comedy than Liar Liar or Bruce Almighty. Right. It's less than a it's less of a romantic comedy than The Mask, I guess, but that's also a different kind of twist on on that kind of romantic comedy. But the reason I call this a romantic comedy is the best parts of it are the romantic comedy. Yeah. I, yeah, that's kind of what I was alluding to, because it's like uh, you have all of these different elements. And in its structure, I almost feel like it's not much of a romantic comedy. It just has a love interest in it, because frankly, every comedy from this period and earlier just had to throw in a love interest for right. no particular reason. Um, but in this case, I think that despite the age difference of 18 years between Jim Carrey and Zoe Deschanel to the day, well, Jim Carrey's because always apparently been a they're child born on the heart. same day. Oh, like, like sometime <laughs> January, in January something. Yeah. yeah. They have the same birthday, but um, well, Jim Carrey's always been that kind of like child at heart persona. Yeah. So I don't, I don't blame it. I don't think. Oh he's, no. And yeah. it's not like once again, like we've talked about this before. I think Zoe Deschanel was like twenty six or twenty seven. Right, or she's in like her that. she was in her late twenties, and he was in his late forties. Yeah, it's not like know? Christina Ricci and Johnny Depp and Sleepy Hollow, which was <laughs> yeah, that's a little bit sketchier because it's so it. close to just yeah, it was pushing it. It's it actually is, a smaller, it is not illegal. It is yeah, technically not illegal, which is yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I <laughs> think that, that was an even want. smaller age gap is just a weirder period of time for that versus well, Zoe Deschanel being like yeah, it al it always depends. Last adult. <laughs> it always depends. Somebody who is, um, if it's a smaller wage gap or smaller wage gap, smaller age gap, but they're m both parties are much younger. It's it can sometimes yeah. be worse. So it's weird. Yeah, it, this this one it doesn't feel too weird. But I even remember thinking watching this when I was younger. I was like, isn't he a lot older than her? Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know, but I just felt it. But their chemistry is actually really good. So it is. that's another thing. Um, they're you know they're both completely adult, so age problems not really a problem here. I don't think not for me personally. They are also, also not literally like dating or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. And then they're good um, together on screen. Like yeah. they have really good chemistry here, which I guess is why, like maybe it does feel a little bit more like a rom-com just because those points in the movie are kind of the highlight, even though you do get a lot, most of the movie, like Jim Carrey's in every scene, but you don't really get like, she's not in every scene, you know, and you don't get scenes without Jim Carrey with her, you know, it no, really is she, his movie. She's just a catalyst and she doesn't right. have much to a character. She has a very flimsy, like second act turn. She's a manic pixie eyes. dream girl, which Zoe Deschanel has frequently been like. That's her. Those that's types her typecast. <laughs> that's yeah. her typecast for starting. Sure. Starting with Elf in 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 my eyes. Yeah, Elf. Um, Five Hundred Days of Summer. Five Hundred Days of Summer. What she is much better in that movie than this. Yes. but she's also given much more. Right. So. She has a lot more to do in that movie than here, but she's still really good here. She just. There's I mean, a reason. New Girl was a comedy written around yeah. that typecast. So. Right, and that's a great show. I actually just finished watching that show again through with Hannah and I were watching it. We just wrapped it up. So it's funny watching this again at the same time because this character is so much like that character but also not like that character at all. Well, it wasn't so. too far off from – it's not too far off from what Hollywood saw 
uh, Zoe Deschanel as. Right. Right. And uh, I don't think she's played anything else that I've seen. There's always she's some always musical. That. <laughs> yeah, there's always some musical component to her characters. But um, this movie's. Yeah, Mun- Munchausen syndrome by proxy or whatever. <laughs> Munchausen it's called. by proxy. Munchausen it's such by a proxy. Funny band name. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you get kind of so you've got Jim Carrey's character Carl, and he lives alone. He's recently divorced from a brief marriage, and you have his best friend played by Bradley Cooper. Which this is just the kind of role that Bradley Cooper had in the. I 2000s. completely forgot this was Bradley <laughs> Cooper. That's how different he is than any of his other roles. Right. After. Well, in the two thousands, he was either the best friend or the asshole boyfriend. You know, <laughs> he was one of those. <laughs> so he, that was kind of his typecast for that period of time. And here he is, sure enough, there. There's an unfortunate um, Danny Masterson in here. So oh, yeah. not, I mean, not anybody in, who made this film's fault. Nobody knew what he had done at, back in 2008. So, but either way, it's a little unfortunate seeing him pop up. But on the co- contrast with that, you have Oddly Carl's enough, he's boss. not given much, so it kind of like right. shakes he's, out. He's in the not end. really in it a lot. But no. he's in yeah, it for you... <laughs> he, he's in it for like a payoff for uh, and like obscene joke with uh, with Tilly, Carl's neighbor. Right. So that and that's about all he does. He's just right. he's just the third guy uh, for. For Carl because and Peter's everything that Bradley Cooper's character is doing is has to do with him getting married, like Bradley Cooper's character getting married. Yeah, he and, starts the movie engaged, and then right, basically so the end of it is the bridal shower. He's mad at his friend for dodging him all the time. He didn't show up to their engagement party. He, you know, like Jim Carrey didn't show up for that, and he's just mad at him, and he's telling him he needs to like get his stuff together. Uh, meanwhile, you have his workplace situation where he's somebody who it's that classic comedy thing where their job plays directly into what the concept is going to be for it. Yeah. <laughs> so saying, he saying says no, no to any and all loans. Yeah, yeah. He literally says no to everybody because that's what a loan <laughs> officer kind of does. You know, they just kind of that's kind of their job. Deny they, you they and move and on. Choose. Right. So he Can says we talk no. about Norm. I was, yes. Okay. I love Reese Darby as Reece an actor. Darby is so great. Uh, and this was my introduction to him as an actor. I'd never seen him before that. Flight so of the Concords is, is so good. Right. He's in Flight of the Concords. I hadn't seen that at the point where I saw this, though. So, That's how I know but, him. Somehow I watched that the first time. Now he he's in out. every now he's everywhere. Um his voice is in the Netflix Voltron show. I recognized <laughs> it immediately. Um and then he's also in uh, his show right, or flag means s- death. There are, are our flag means death on Max got canceled, unfortunately, after its second season. But that was a delightful little pirate comedy that he got to be the lead in, which was cool. But I love Rhys Darby, and every scene with him Talk makes about up for us. Um, <laughs> right. every, every scene with him though makes up for any Danny Masterson in the movie. <laughs> he he's one of the only actors that I've seen upstage Jim Carrey. Yeah, like well, <laughs> he just has such like a friendly. Uh, presence and he's just always just trying to be <laughs> Carl's friend throughout the movie and uh, but he's also his boss so there's a, a weird power dynamic there where <laughs> right yeah he can literally fire and promote him on a whim right so. Right. But uh, there's a whole thing where one of the things that Jim Carrey sa- always says no to are Carl or are, are Norm Norman's parties <laughs> but once uh, Carl starts saying say yes, yes to everything. He says yes, he'll go to the party, and then he starts calling him Norm. And Norm's like, "Oh, Norm, <laughs> is that like a nickname? <laughs> Should I call you Ka?" <laughs> it's like, well, Carl's already pretty short, <laughs> but like their dynamic. Like, I almost wish the movie had more of that, you know, like just them specifically. Because I don't know, I just thought that that was one of the more fun dynamics in the movie. Yeah, it does easy. feel like th- there's like an unseen finishing arc with like bradley cooper's because obviously he's he's the one that carl is trying to get back with the most right that that he knows obviously he's picked up a friend in norm and he's picked up uh, a girlfriend in zoe Deschanel's character or like an on and off thing but like bradley cooper is the person that sets him down the path of wanting to rebuild the friendship and it feels like it's all just the payoff of the bridal shower and that's about it Right, right. That's where it's like that part of the movie isn't 
like as interesting as the norm relationship or the Zoe de Chanel relationship. I feel also, like the I new things of, he gets. I, I wanted more of John Michael Higgins. I'm going to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you want more of John Michael Higgins in this exact role, Community. just watch that episode of Community. Yep. It's Can we talk about character. Luis Guzman as well? Being... <laughs> yes. <laughs> Break, speaking of Community, Luis yeah. Guzman shows up in this yeah, no, as a legend. I'm, I'm almost certain. <laughs> That that Dan Harmon watched this movie and was like, I need John Michael Higgins in an exact situation like this, but as like a teacher. Right. <laughs> like he he watched he, he he watched the Dead Poet Society and Yes Man back to back and he was like, hang on a second. I've got the perfect idea got an for idea. an episode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's one of Jeff Winger's best episodes because he learns so much and is also like tested to his usual laziness when it comes to classes like that it's probably yeah, the but, best jeff winger episode but it also yeah that episode's also good because it puts you kind of on jeff's side because this teacher is ridiculous yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. you just can't relate to a man who like uh who in this movie exactly would do the exact same thing it's like hey uh ask me if i want to throw a rock through that window it's like do you want to yeah. throw a rock through that window and it's like yes just does it <laughs> It's like that's the exact same thing that he would do. He just he just eats yeah. like watermelon off the vine for no reason yeah. at all. Just he's that kind of guy. Yeah. That is something I do like about this movie in comparison to some of those other ones like a liar liar. Even like I think Santa Claus the Santa Claus kind of fits into this in terms of movies we've actually talked about on the show uh where it's like a star-led comedy but i like that this isn't magical i like that this is just a decision that he makes yeah. and he like just really commits to it because then you do get a little bit of a quandary of him like whenever he says no you know and he gets in his own head because bad things happen because <laughs> The Terrence Stamp character, I think his name is Terrence, yeah. Terrence, yeah. They they um, literally just took Terrence Stamp's name and added an R. I'm not joking. All right. They did. They gave him two R's and Terrence instead of one. That's right. all they did. Right. But when Terrence Stamp's character makes the covenant with Carl, uh, you um it's not a magical thing at all. And but he does say that if you go off the path, things have a way of like working themselves out or whatever. And so you the first time he says no is to the which the horny old lady. Um this was the scene that was always skipped when I watched Please, it. Please, her name is Tilly. Younger. Put some respect <laughs> on that name. Well, I just don't know why that was a trope for like a just a brief period. Like with things like Kingpin and you don't mess mess with the Zohan. You know, oh, you yeah. had that this horny old horny lady. Horny old trope grandmas, yeah. <laughs> just cut popping up in comedies. That's that's a movie during trope this period right now. of time. Yeah. yeah. I don't know why. I'm glad that kind of went by the wayside for the most part. Because that was a weird one. Uh I think so, those directors have never seen or heard of what menopause is, I guess. <laughs> but I don't know. I guess I'm, I'm not against old ladies getting some. <laughs> it's just they, they make right. them really horny in these tombstone. movies. <laughs> but yeah, it's a, it's, that's an uncomfortable scene for sure. But that's why it works for him saying no in that scene. And then he like falls yeah, it's in front of the dog. It's an uncomfortable situation. It's like, it's like, what are you willing to say yes to? Because right. you have to say yes. Right. And I mean, this movie doesn't like explore that too far. That yeah, whole like. That's the biggest disappoint for, disappointment right. for me with Same. specifically Jim Carrey's character is right. because there, there is some mystical, like mystical elements to it. No, because his dream is like a little bit mystical, even though it's just a dream. But so is the him saying no to his ex-wife after she breaks up with her boyfriend. And right. the elevator gets stuck, which that kind of thing technically can happen, sure. But Black Cat and then some guy immediately towing his car and whether or not it's just because he kind of looks like Jim Carrey. But that's kind of a, a very strange scene for it not to be like somewhat mystical. I mean, you could argue, I guess, that it's mystical, but I feel like it's just hid. It's kind of in between, you know, like yeah. all the stuff in his head and coincidences kind of playing into it. I mean, it it's really just something the to a mental kind of leading into it too, more than anything. It's either it's either in between three things: either it is mysticism on the movie's part, either it's confirmation bias, like anything that can go wrong, you'll notice it. Right. Or it's like a mental breakdown kind of thing, which yeah. happens I, all the time. I would time. argue mostly for um, the whole, you know, com confirmation, like the almost a self fulfilling prophecy kind of thing. Sure. Um, but yeah, I, I can I can see somebody arguing it. I don't know who's going to be really 
arguing too staunchly about any point about yes man but <laughs> it's not necessarily a criticism I, I guess my criticism for that would be i wish it like went all in with that yeah it it feels like that would have been like a super interesting thing maybe they were trying to make it not seem more like bruce almighty but i don't know my favorite jim carrey movie of all time is bruce almighty outside of eternal sunshine but like jim carrey movie is right like comedy because yeah yeah, it it captures like the essence of what we've expected from like a jim carrey character so well yeah and it went through all these like tropes in such a natural and like interesting way it also has morgan freeman i mean how do you turn him down so (laughs) yeah i think my favorite jim carrey comedy is either liar liar or actually the cable guy (laughs) <laughs> oh that's a good one too guy. yeah <laughs> but, um, because that's just that's an interesting like sub- subversive take on that kind of like right. jim carrey plus like what you would expect in that situation yeah that's that's a right good one. yeah but let's also um, put some respect on the dumb and dumber <laughs> dumb and dumber is great dumb and dumber is great i i like dumb and dumber but i i just my my two favorites are probably those two as far as his comedies go sure but um, yeah, so the Zoe de Chanel character is probably the second most significant character in the film. Her name's Allison in this movie. Right. Um, he runs into her because he takes a homeless man home right after the convention where he starts saying yes to things <laughs> due to John Michael Higgins prompting. And he then he actually he, says yes. <laughs> yes. And <laughs> I I really wish that guy had come up again because it's that whole like. I just wait outside this uh I just wait outside this theater every like Thursday and people just like say yes to give me everything. <laughs> it's like he is intro- at the homeless shelter when he's serving soup, but that's like oh, that's barely true. Just, yeah. So he's, he's back. Uh, he's in also the movie at the barely. end. He's buying clothes from from them at yes. the end. I forgot yeah. about that. So he, he pops up a couple times throughout the movie, but it, yeah, that's his only real like scene, I say in quotes. But it, but he's got like the most interesting like take. It's like obviously if everyone who comes out of the theater has to say yes. Like you could be very opportunistic with that. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, but but he he gives him a ride home to his like little bush that he lives in, I guess. On um, top of a big hill. <laughs> on top of a big hill. Uh, nowhere so then he close has to, to walk a gas to get station. Gas. Yeah. Yeah, and he also uses his phone to talk to other homeless people, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a funny bit. <laughs> it is, and and so he he runs carl's phone out of battery so he has no battery he has no gas and he's on top of a hill so he comes all the way down to a gas station where he runs into allison so yes it is like a he wouldn't but it's also that kind of thing where he says no in the early parts of the movie he says no to a person saying hey come check out this band and that band just happens to have zoe de chanel in it right so if he had said yes to a few things he would have run into her which um, right this is Los Angeles, so <laughs> it's it's that same kind of thing where like Los Angeles is a big town, so it's not like it's right. not like you're gonna be running into that kind of person. Over I do over. appreciate though that <laughs> after that first interaction with her where she rides him back to his car on her bike, um, and then they kiss on top of the hill because I was he about said, to say that's a euphemism for something, is it not? <laughs> <laughs> but uh after that first scene, she doesn't show up again for a while, not until he does say yes to that. So I like that there's a little bit of a break. It almost makes it a little bit more believable because <laughs> he doesn't just run into her out in the wild somewhere. It's it's more of a very specific situation. No, all of the times that her. he runs into her first, he has to say yes to something. Right. So, right, yeah. right. So and then that kind of after, though, he goes to the... <laughs> Uh, Munchauser by Proxy concert, which has like eight people at a bar <laughs> and they're weird ass music, which is really funny. If I'm being honest, I really it, like, it's that like what the people in, it's like what the people in the, in all the concerts in Scott Pilgrim, like think they are versus like what they actually are. It's probably just all like eight people at a bar screaming and cheering for a band that nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as a, as a man who's been to several like live concerts with only like eight people. Yeah. I can attest to that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> you think you're, you think you're more popular than you actually are. Yeah. But then, then she starts to be more present in the movie after that immediately. Like they start talking that he basically asks her on a date and then she says she does like a, running photography morning thing like at bright and early in the morning and then he's like oh great i'll do that and yeah, then it's it's his, photography uh, jogging because like right. everyone 
does photography and everybody jogs, but nobody. And it's another quirky thing for Zoe Deschanel. Nobody's to do. seen blurry pictures of right. of people while they're on a on a jog at before. <laughs> right, right. So, but then he gets like called to like do an all nighter with Red Bull, which. Let me just say, one, that Red Bull scene is pretty fun, where he's just, like, freaking out on Red Bull. But and also, then he crashes two, down the road. <laughs> yeah. This movie has, like, an insane amount of product placement. Product placement, yeah. <laughs> like, there's, like, Tempur-Pedic is one of the things he says yes to, and he jumps on it and literally does the commercial thing with the wine glass. Um, something, something, <laughs> 71 million, something, something, relatively new director. So. <laughs> How there's do you like a, get the money? Yeah, there's like a weird like Costco reference. There's Someone like, says, "Whoa, man, nice car!" And then he drives away, and it's like, is he driving like an '80s BMW or something like that? And it's like, <laughs> right. okay, nice car, I guess. The the what's the male nurse character name? Lee. Um, Lee. Oh, Ducati. Lee, Lee gets a Ducati, <laughs> and then there's a no, whole he, scene he, later he in the movie a with Ducati. a Ducati. Yeah, <laughs> and then there's obviously the Red Bull scene, but like. <laughs> It's 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 done in a way that I think the scenes with the product placement are funny. So I kind of forgive it a little bit, even though it's like the most brazen it's not subtle. product placement I've seen in like it's not, a while. It's not subtle. <laughs> it's it's almost like off putting, like how much product placement is in this. It's movie. a bit like Tony Stark driving up to Captain America in an Audi, and it's like, okay, I'm right. in an Audi, by the way. Did you know I right, was in but- an Audi? <laughs> At least in this, they're like saying the things in a funny way. Like you said, Ducati. Because now when I think of Ducati, I think of that way it said. Yeah. You know? Whereas it's like, like in, Wayne's World. Right. Like right, little, right. yellow, different. <laughs> Whereas in like something like a Marvel movie, like you mentioned with like the Audis, they're just like kind of gotta all get Audis. Somehow. Like yeah. they don't reference that it's an Audi and that every car seems to be an Audi. <laughs> but they yeah, all it's are. Not like Jarvis, I'm reason. taking the Audi, <laughs> right. which is my preferred car, by the way. <laughs> it's like in, uh, I just watched Argyle, which is produced by Apple. And every Apple movie, every tech product is apple <laughs> so <laughs> oh it's like it's like in every spider-man movie there are sony headsets yes sony every computers. sony movie like there's... every everything is sony gran turismo was the worst with that there's a oh, whole thing with walkman <laughs> <laughs> they were like oh, didn't add bet. basically for their new walkmans you know <laughs> <laughs> Which like th- that no movie feels like an advertisement in general for like no one's gonna be wearing those yeah. they're gonna be wearing like airpods or like beats or they'll be wearing like if if they're wearing Sony, they'll be wearing like the actual headphones. <laughs> Calm yes. down. <laughs> so this movie at least takes the product placement and turns it into gags, which I appreciate. Because a lot of times you just get product placement and it just feels like you're in a commercial all of a sudden. <laughs> sure. So in this case, I appreciate it more when they like really lean into it. Kind of like, I don't know if you've watched the show Chuck, but there's a point where Subway became yep. one of their biggest sponsors. Yeah. And they're just constantly referencing how good Subway is after that point. So it's like, I like again, that more it's though. that community episode. Right. The community did the same thing kind of with Subway. Cheryl uh, meets Subway. All right. What's your name though? Subway. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did want to talk about the music because this movie yes. specifically and uh, kids movies like Over the Hedge and also, I mean, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. It had some of those like for no reason at all. It just grabbed like random indie stars that nobody would know. I mean, Beck is obviously for Scott Pilgrim vs. the World the most well known, but they grabbed Metric, who I've seen in concert. They are a phenomenal band, but no one knows them outside of the people who would know. But and Over the Hedge has been Foster. And this movie, I believe Von Iva. Von Iva is the name of the uh band that is the rest of Munchausen by proxy. Right. Well and then somebody did the music who who is the Eels. composer? eels yeah it's another yeah weird little indie band that's composing this i know people like even um i actually i kind of love that when that happens in movies though this is a weird case for that because usually it's in kind of a more independent feeling movie than this yeah um where that happens like in uh her you have arcade fire doing the score for that or like um in uh the movie why can't it swiss army man oh you know, yeah ha- hannah's favorite daniel, band is uh, uh, daniel Manchester Radcliffe movie. orchestra yeah that's hannah's that's my wife's favorite band <laughs> that does but the soundtrack for, or the score speaking of favorite band this this movie has helicopters uh by block party which is one of my favorite bands and yeah uh, it's that's specifically for the jogging photography scene but uh, it also has the rick and tours which 
Uh, if you don't know, that's Jack White's new yes. band after the White yeah. Stripes. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's most prominent song is probably the Journey song, Separate Ways, which I love that song. Which so they okay play on it. that. It's his ringtone. So <laughs> right. uh, at any time that anybody calls him, you hear Separate Ways by Journey. <laughs> right. Including the very opening of the film. And you have to think. And then the Ducati. Yeah. You have to think that he picked that because he's got an ex-wife. <laughs> I have to Maybe, think this is like a breakup song. I don't know. It felt too on the nose for it not to right. be the case. Well, but then they use it at the end of the movie when he's on the Ducati trying to race out of the hospital. Trying, to yeah, to trying to get Zoe back Deschanel. to Allison. So yeah. it's a payoff. Yeah, which I mean, I love that song so much that I'm just like, I'm cool with like a bike <laughs> flying down the road to separate ways playing in the background. That feels good to me. That feels right. It's definitely so. one of those songs that like Journey has like faithfully in uh movies or sorry songs like that but they've also got their kind of like rock hits like separate ways like wheel in the sky but so they right. they've got plenty of things to go with that genre it's just been a while since i've heard that song specifically uh-huh <laughs> yeah i mean i think of like tron this. legacy it's in it in the arcade but that song only oh, that's I true I, I could have sworn but it plays that song for was literally in... five seconds because I then it's what swat- then it swaps to uh uh, Eurythmics, Sweet Dreams. <laughs> yeah, I, I I could have sworn that that song was in the original Tron, but it came out after the original Tron. It did. So, but like my brain like flipped them up. So every time I watch Tron, I expect to hear that song, and I'm like, never mind, it's in the sequel. <laughs> I mean, Tron came out in '82, right? And Separate right. Ways, I think, came out in '83. '84, '83 so. or '84, like re- literally right after. But it, oh, there was January a different '83. <laughs> yeah, there was a different. Um, Journey song in Tron. <laughs> if only in Tron Arcade, had waited so. months, just a few months. <laughs> right. They would have had the perfect electro synth kind of rock song <laughs> to go with their movie. Right. But, oh, well, they, they'll just shove it in the sequel, I guess. But yeah. <laughs> just like a lot of things that they just shoved into that sequel. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, there's like the, the moralistic kind of journey of this movie kind of ends with once Zoe de Chanel, so he's getting arrested, which is actually a really funny idea because all all the things he says yes to, including like uh, basically a mail order bride, going to and, Nebraska for a weekend, just random, yeah, just yeah. a random Nebraska city that they go to just on a trip, just to say like let's just go wh- wherever the first person says to go. <laughs> yeah, it's like all of these little things that he had been doing, taking like Korean classes. <laughs> um, Have you recently he then started has learning to, Korean? Yeah. Yeah, he then has to explain to the authorities why he's doing this because they start to suspect him, I guess, in this scene, which is it forces him to the whole point in that is to force him to reveal the information to Zoe Deschanel. And that's what Peter is is his attorney. (laughs) Right. I guess Peter's a lawyer. (laughs) I guess he is. (laughs) But that ends up forcing the revelation to Allison that he's been saying yes to everything. And so she's really hurt by that because she's like, are you just doing this because you're saying yes or because you actually care about me? That whole kind of thing. But like – yeah, she would have had to figure out that like the the going to Nebraska for a weekend that was his idea. Several of the things were going to be his idea. Right. It's like Which, a ugh. Yeah, at <laughs> least it's, it's late enough in the movie. It's flimsy, but it's late enough in the movie that it's not like a big deal because the movie wraps up pretty quickly still after that, you know, once he gets in that accident. But how does he get in the hospital again? Oh, uh he shows up in Terrence's car and says, "Terrence, don't freak out." And Terrence Right, freak out. and Terrence immediately freaks out. It's yeah. so funny because <laughs> it's so like jarring. He, he waits until up. the car. He waits until the car is not only on, but he waits until he's like ready to start going before he says, "Terrence, right. don't freak out." He could have said it before he got into the car, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> he could have. He could have done it in any other way. But yeah, he could have just really waited funny. outside. Yeah, he ends up in the hospital, and because Lee's a male nurse and his new friend, who he got a Ducati because he gave Lee a loan because that's something he's been doing throughout the movie since saying yes now he's saying yes to every loan that's which somehow gets him a promotion (laughs) that scene in the hospital is the only time where i looked at danny uh masterson's character and i was like that was a funny bit that he just did because the the female nurse comes in and checks on carl and like looks at peter and and rooney his uh, who is danny masterson's character and you can see i i backed up because what he says after she leaves is like so off the cuff and weird that 
I, I rewound it and he's just looking at her like a dead stare, thousand yard stare the whole time. And he was yeah. like, she did it again. She wants me. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. I'm pretty sure he was just, she was just here to check on Carl. It's one, it's of, one of those, things. it's one of those things that I think I found funny in the past, but just knowing Danny Masterson at this point, I'm just like, ah, that's off putting. I don't like I, that. I don't care. <laughs> what, yeah, I don't care. No, it's I funny. Care. It makes me laugh. Yeah. He's in jail, thankfully, but like. I can laugh about it because of that. <laughs> yeah, that's that's true. At least he did get it get put in jail. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Either way. Um Yeah, but then yeah, he leaves the hospital on the Ducati because Lee's there and he got Lee a Ducati from with the loan. Um and so then you get I'm so your disappointed every single finale. time you say Ducati, you're not saying it like Ducate. Ducate. So he gets on his Ducate Thank you. and drives the Ducate <laughs> to Zoe de Chanel, who's doing her morning run situation and photography jogging yeah he's still in his um what's it called scrub uh, uh it's like a it's like a hospital gown kind of yeah he's in his hospital gown still um so you get some funny shots of his butt <laughs> was like, oh, that was butt. all the rage in the 2000s man <laughs> it really was i mean shrek shrek <laughs> Shrek is a staple of <laughs> somehow that. shrek applies to this <laughs> shrek does apply to it Honestly, in the 2000s, Shrek applied to basically everything. Yeah, Shrek basically set the staple for the 2000s <laughs> comedy. Fart jokes and butt shots. Yep. But, uh, yeah, and then you kind of get a pretty clean wrap-up to the movie and moral lesson learned, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but, yeah, do you have anything else you want to talk about with the movie in particular? Oh yeah, he he literally uh, Jim Carrey literally learned Korean and guitar yeah, for this movie, he did. and he said that guitar was one of the hardest things that he'd ever done, as well as he did his own stunts. Tom oh Cruise yeah, yeah, -esque. with like the bungee gump jumping. I know they did that after they finished shooting. Yeah, that was <laughs> the last. That was the last stuff. thing. Yep, insurance was yep. like, all right, Jim Carrey is one of the most profitable beings in the world we can't have you like killing the man i think he also broke a couple ribs yeah like, so the waiter down. scene at the beginning where he uh says to his ex-wife all right i gotta go i'm gonorrhea and then he's like <laughs> oh wow that's weird which is a funny joke I, I would have laughed it off but yeah he says that and then he turns around and accidentally runs into the wait waitress uh who is holding a platter full of glasses breaks that and he goes head over heels and falls on the ground. And as he was doing that, uh, during a take, he broke three ribs. Yeah. That's Just where it's doing like, that. uh, <laughs> that's where it's like the rubber man of Jim Carrey. Yeah. That is kind of the appeal of him. Maybe he shouldn't be doing that exact kind of thing in his late forties. I was about to say, but... <laughs> yeah, this is pretty close to like the end of his like physical comedy career. So <laughs> right, right. Probably so... because of the three ribs. <laughs> <laughs> Although I have enjoyed his return in the Sonic movies, as much as those movies are just kind of what they are, they're I basically enjoy them. they they are yeah. basically like Sega trying to get get Sonic back on the map and using Jim Carrey as the as the mainstay of it. Right, like how do we get people to watch this movie? Let Jim Carrey Jim do Carrey. wild yeah. zany stuff. <laughs> so he doesn't and, even hey, sound like kind of... Doctor Eggman, but it doesn't matter because it's just <laughs> Jim Carrey. Right, it's just him doing his thing. But frankly, like we haven't been getting him doing his thing for so long at this point that it's like i'm well that's honestly very not since basically this <laughs> yeah honestly we didn't do very many like high profile comedies after this other than like mr popper's penguins in 2011 which that is a roller coaster of a movie <laughs> <laughs> i haven't seen that one in a long time and i only saw it once so yeah <laughs> but um yeah no but that's do you everything wanna, yeah do you want to get into scoring then Let's do it. So for this show, as always, we have 10 categories. Our scores go from, for each category, zero to two, zero being bad, one being good, two being great. We do that in a way that it's vague, and it's also our score, not necessarily the individual or what we think the movie actually is. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Our first category, as usual, is writing. I think it's solid, just one. Yeah, I think a one. I think the idea is really strong and they do have a lot of fun with the idea. I just wish they went further with it in pretty much any direction, <laughs> but they right. don't. It's just kind of very broad, which, as we talked about, is appealing to a general audience. But I understand why the critical response wouldn't be as high. 
So, yeah. and I think that's kind of chalked up to Obviously, how, it's trying to get a lot do. of money back. And yeah. they had to like handicap their own movie in a way or their own like movie writing in that way. But it, yeah, it just feels like a missed opportunity for, for a, a great bit of it compared to other specifically Jim Carrey movies and Jim Carrey movies are a roller coaster of quality as it, as it stands anyway. So, yeah, I mean, even among their comedies, they're wildly like people are like, this is one of my favorite comedies ever. Or like, I didn't think that was funny at all. <laughs> even things like Ace Ventura, people think that way about it. You know, and Well, stuff like Ace, that. Ace Ventura, Ace Ventura in and of itself, the second one, it's a much different quality than the first one. Right. It's definitely not the same. So, I've only seen the scene where he comes out of the rhino's butt in the second yeah. one, so I can't speak yeah. to it. <laughs> but I yeah. do enjoy the first one, despite some of its problems. <laughs> but most of his comedies are ab about the same in quality. I'd say right. most of his comedies tend to be the above average kind of for movie right. making. And I think this one kind of fits with that for me. I don't think it's one of his best, but I do think that it has the same appeal that his better comedies do have. Um, both in kind of some of the zaniness, what he gets to do, and in kind of some of the heartwarming aspects. A lot of his comedies do have that quality to it, specifically things like Liar Liar, Bruce Almighty. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think this enough, does that pretty well. Oddly enough, it's it's because this doesn't feel as fulfilling as the other ones, where if it had been, those moments would have been among his best when it came to his comedies. Right. The rest of his comedies. Yeah. But yeah, it is just just that little bit heartbreaking to see uh, a movie that could have been the outstanding comedy from liar liar or Bruce almighty, but it just retreads it and is, is worse in some aspects when it could have been better. Right. Uh, world building. I'm thinking, which is our next category yes. is about the same for me. Same. I would agree. I think once again, they're playing into their ideas well, and I like the kind of world being a little like zanier than our world, you know, <laughs> like it's definitely feels grounded in our world, but the actual things that happen in the movie are, it's elevated, I guess. You just take weird stuff from our world and just elevate it a notch. And it is and kind of weird that Nick, who I believe is, um, yeah, John Michael H Higgins character. It's funny that he says like, oh, I like ate that and like went surfing in Laos or something like that. And right. it's just weird. I shot a cow with a bazooka. <laughs> yeah, I shot a cow with a bazooka. It's so weird that with $71 million, you couldn't at least show like a montage of him doing like those kind of weird things where it's like he's learning Korean and he's mastering the guitar. I guess you don't want to show <laughs> that then though. Like, uh, oh, you're saying Jim Carrey. Yeah, Jim Carrey's character. Okay, I thought you were going to sing for oh, no, no, no. John Michael we, Higgins. We I was like, trust you don't me, want to see that. Knowing then. John Michael Higgins' care, uh, at knowing John Michael Higgins and what he's cast at, I absolutely believe. I don't need to see the receipts <laughs> on that. He absolutely right. could do that. But I, yeah. I think showing a like a montage of Jim Carrey doing some weird, outlandish things would have been just showing the dichotomy of like where he was in the beginning of the movie, where he's yeah. like one of the most depressed people with like. A, he's got a stable job, but it's not going anywhere. He's got a failed relationship already. And it's that kind of like dichotomy between like living your best life versus being in the worst spot in your life kind of thing. Yeah. Right. C characters, which is our next one as well. I'm thinking still the same. I think yeah, it's still this just one, a one. This one feels like it's going to be a lot of ones. There's a lot of things that it does well. I think that some of his like Peter and I, the, Danny Masterson character are a little They're light, but then, burgers. but then you get like Norm and I think Allison is Allison as well, well defined for you what get Nick, she is, but only like two minutes of Nick, Give right? Me more Nick, make Nick be Peter, take away Peter, put Nick there. <laughs> Even Lee, like I like a lot of the side, like really side characters in this movie, like the Louise Guzman scene. I can't believe we haven't really like talked about that. True. <laughs> Every time I hear that third eye blind song, I cannot think of anything but this scene. I wish you would step back from that ledge, my friend. Ah. <laughs> right. And the way that Carrie sings that, yep. which Jim Carrey can't sing. Like you see no, that in the <laughs> <laughs> kind of like, like I, he sings the, you're a mean one, Mr. Grinch in the, <laughs> he has a way of singing. That's interesting. Um, like it's a little bit better than you would think it would be, I guess, but he plays it goofy. Um, in that scene in particular, but then also in the scene uh, where he sings the Beatles song, where they oddly enough the that that's Hollywood that's Bowl. a lot better than his version of Jumper. 
Oh yeah, that say. like when he's just singing like that. His version of Jumper is like I said, it's very goofy. Like he's singing in a very silly way. But right, yeah. But yeah, I think that also uh, I've got blisters on my fingers. Is <laughs> yeah, a, from yep. the Helter Skelter. From yeah, Ringo. <laughs> yep, that's that's good as well. Yeah. Just Jim Carrey doing Jim Carrey things is fun, which is part of why I think the characters ends up out of one because I think Jim yeah, Carrey. Yeah, it would be a zero without so Allison, well. Norm, or uh, Jim uh, Carl. I'd give Terrence a little credit there too, because Terrence is like a really good version of this kind of weird. I character. agree, but I honestly don't think that's a character. I think they just they just somehow recorded Terrence for about five minutes, <laughs> taking off his shoes to go sprint to a chair. He does seem like an odd hit, guy. Hit, hitting Jim Carrey with his microphone multiple times, yeah. Right. No, that's, that's just him. <laughs> All right, directing. Um, also I think Peyton one. Reed, yeah, does a solid job <laughs> directing. He's a solid comedy director, as we've kind of pointed out. I think he does a good job here. Nothing fancy, nothing phenomenal, but he does a good job at getting the comedy across. He he lets so, Jim Carrey cook. Right. Yeah. So I, I give directing a one. Um, acting. Kind of a one here too is what I'm thinking. I kind of agree. I think a strong one is fair. It's yeah. just close to being a two. And I don't yeah, know Yeah, I think who if I there would... was more for the supporting characters. Yeah. Like to what they can do. But there's If it just, was just Zoe yeah. Deschanel, Jim Carrey, and Reese Darby, it would definitely be a two. <laughs> Yeah, it's just the other characters just aren't as defined in their characters and that performances follow suit. So, yeah, I'm I'm at a one with acting. Also, uh, as we've said before, if you like Reese Darby in this movie, watch Flight of the Concords. It's amazing. <laughs> yes, absolutely. 100%. <laughs> and Reese Darby turns it up to a 10 in that TV show. So, <laughs> sorry, turns right. it to 11. Yeah. <laughs> Next category is visuals. Um, oddly enough, I'm actually between a zero and a one on this one. Uh, that's where I'm at with this one too. Cause it's got that bright two thousands comedy look that isn't like, it's just, it's kind of like what we talked about with the movie where it's broadly appealing, but not like specifically, there's no real visual texture to it. There's, there's not no like visual a great... scene that I can point to where it's like, wow, that's a highlight. Right. It just kind of does what it does. I think I'm, it doesn't look bad though. No. It's just well, kind of like, it just looks the way it looks, which I think that for us, that puts it at a zero, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Yeah. yeah zero for not, us has always been between bad and poor because two has to be between great and perfection, basically. Right. So <laughs> it's that kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah, if it's just average, then I would say, yeah, zero. It's not, or if it's, it's not a particular. I would say good. among even like, like the mask would be an easy one. I think Liar Liar would kind of get to that one for visual specifically. Yeah. I think Bruce Almighty would get to a one easily. Um, yeah. This one has some like, I, I do think even some of the cinematography choices are fun and good. Like you get yeah. the shot of him when he like wakes up in the bathroom. That's like homaging that David Bowie album. David Bowie, yeah. For some reason. <laughs> and then you have like in that jumper scene, you have like the camera panning around at that one point. And it looks like, I don't know, there are parts of this that compel me to like want to give it a one in visuals. Because I do think, like I said, Peyton Reed is a good director for comedies and he knows what he's doing he knows how to place the camera to get good comedic effect um right i think he brings a lot out of it but i just don't know if that visual quality is consistent enough throughout the film to even to put it in a one so yeah. if you want to revisit it we can but i'm good with a zero on it no i i think a zero is perfectly fine given my thoughts on like yeah. the missed opportunity of what it could have been yeah i think we have to put that into account as well if it's like a yep. good but it missed a lot of things yeah yeah um editing editing i'm kind of out of one with here too like editing can kill a comedy yeah um, i brought up argyle which i just watched and put out a review for but man the editing kills that comedy like that movie is like it's a slog at some points and there are funny things happening but i wasn't laughing this one the editing does keep it moving and keeps the comedy hitting the way it should so I, I, I'm going to, I feel like editing is a one. Yeah. I don't think I can give it a zero, even though I was kind of ankling towards that, but yeah, that was mostly just again, because it feels like the editing or the pacing specifically to me, it feels like a two out of 10. 
It just feels like it. that's what slowed the movie down in a way where it should have been building up and building up and building up. Like when you say yes to everything, everything changes. It's not it's not just going to slow down in parts or and that's where it becomes the kind of romantic comedy is because it slows down in parts for the Allison character or like for the Norm character. It doesn't mm-hmm. really like give the the aspect of saying yes to everything, the time of day in a way that feels compelling as much as it could have been. Yeah. And I think some of that is on the editing, but I think a one is fair because yeah, yeah, it doesn't kill the comedy. The comedy is still there, but right. yeah, it's, it's just all right. Yeah. All right. Sound. Um, I honestly want to give it a two. <laughs> you want to give I, it a I two? I do because it's got so <laughs> many, so many bands and so many, like this is a movie that uses it does feel out of place, though. I would understand a one because, like, for a movie specifically like this, the soundtrack feels kind of out of place. But it's yeah. such a good soundtrack. This I feels right sound, along with, like, yeah. an Over the Hedge or, like, a Scott Pilgrim versus the World. But, yeah, it does kind of feel out of place for a movie like this. But I just – I don't feel like it's doing anything with its sound to elevate it to that two. But – I do think it's one still because I do th- one. I like the music in it. Those band choices are kind of off the w- wall and weird, yeah, but I'll I like say, it. I'll say it could have been worse. It could have yes. been. It could have been Suicide Squad, the first one. Oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah this it doesn't feel like that at all. Where it's just like pounding you with soundtrack over and over again. The soundtrack is just it incorporated well in. Yeah, the it's film. not like uh, <laughs> House of the Rising Sun for this character bohemian rhapsody for that character we're not doing that we're not spending most of the budget on licensing for songs that people know we're taking songs that are kind of that quality this soundtrack would be right in the alley of 500 days of summer because like a lot of it yeah like millennial kind of feel-good movie yeah i think 500 days of summer good movie uses the soundtrack in a little bit more in your face kind of way. Whereas this is a lot of it really is just backdrop. Yeah. this, um, And especially uh, with eels songs specifically, they're just so they, when they're in the backdrop, they feel kind of derivative, but they're definitely not. And that's right. akin to most of the songs in here. So like, yeah. if you're just listening to, or if you're just watching this movie in the theaters, I could understand if you wouldn't be able to name a single song aside from, I think, ways. I think I'm with you. I think the soundtrack is a two, but the sound in the movie as a whole is a one. <laughs> sure. I'll, I'll agree with that mostly because it's mostly just my personal feelings on the soundtrack yeah. as a whole, not so much the way it's implemented into the movie. Right. And like the score is nothing special in the movie. And no, yeah. I couldn't tell you anything about the score right now. Exactly. But that, that's exactly. par for the course for me. I can't tell you anything about right. scores I mean, it's that a 2000s comedy. It's not like a make or break thing. But yeah, it's like, yeah, I, could, I couldn't, I wouldn't feel right giving it the sound of two. Also, uh, his rendition of Jumper could have been better. That's a one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You could have sang it straight exactly. <laughs> rather than all weird. <laughs> um, but let's see. Genre. This is a comedy. Um, pretty. It's a concept comedy, if you want to call it that. Yeah. Um, it has romantic col- comedy elements. I feel like this is another one. <laughs> I'll agree. I think it, it does laughed, well. Like, it is funny. I laughed a lot more than I thought I was going to. But yeah. I think that's mostly because I forgot most of the movie. So it was yeah. like that retread and also of the comedies I've seen in the last like 15 years, it, none of them have connected with me in a way that like they Jim Carrey comedies. Them out in the same kind of way. Like no. comedies have been kind of reduced to streaming fodder a lot of the times. Yeah. Lately. Because and everyone thinks that they have, can do comedy. Right. And, and studios just don't have the confidence for theatrical distribution for a lot of times. So even when they do put a comedy in theaters, it doesn't get the kind of, you know, support that it needs to become something that you know people you know connect with right so i don't know i've been kind of disheartened by the state of comedy lately so it's kind of nice going back to right when this kind of comedy was kind of on in its last days and just kind of seeing that there was still life in it then and i i wish that studios didn't just kind of back off of comedies at that time but yeah yeah but, i'm not i'm not quite a two with this one i i think that it under delivers on its concept just a little too much that i wish it went further with its comedy i also do think it takes a little while before jim carrey gets to be unleashed in yeah. a way um versus like stuff like i think liar liar and bruce almighty um he that gets a little 
going a little fast. Liar, liar. You know? He kills it from the beginning, man. That Absolutely. Is, that is a great so, performance from him. <laughs> it, it really is. So I, I feel like comedy is a, a solid one. Agree or disagree? Yeah, I'm going to, I'll say yeah, but mostly because I did laugh quite a bit, but in comparing it to other Jim Carrey comedies specifically, this is probably close to the bottom of the pool because right. he's got so many good ones. I mean, so. there he does have a number of ones. That, I don't love all of his Fairly Brother ones. I really don't. Um, I don't. I've even never know seen I like. any of those of the movies. Like me, that I've myself, seen? and Irene. Um, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. I think like, he, I think yeah. I'd put this movie above Fun with Dick and Jane, yeah. and above Mr. Popper's Penguins and um, the second Ace Ventura movie. I think that's about it of the movies I've seen, and I've seen like ten of his comedies. Right. So it's kind of average to slightly below average. Of the things that I have seen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of with that. Cause I, yeah. Um, I think it's right in the middle, which for Jim Carrey comedies, I, I like Jim Carrey. That's above average for comedy. That's generally above average, but for him, I still think it's kind of lesser. Yeah. So, um, yeah, let's see. And then impact is our final category. I'm between a zero and a one on this. If I'm being honest. Yeah. I think, I think either a zero or a one would be fair. Either one would would be. I think people have seen this quite a bit over. It technically like, the made years. money because Jim Carrey didn't right. take an upfront payment. He Apparently took thirty six percent of profits after budgeting and marketing. Right. So, I guess it still made enough money for him. And uh, there's not really any like careers that have been influenced by this movie no. specifically in and fact, the way i think about it is um in 20 years how are people going to be talking about this movie and i'm like they probably much, just yeah. aren't going to be you know yeah. it's probably just not going to be something that's really talking hell who's about. talking about it now <laughs> right exactly like i among jim carrey comedies you hear those other ones that we've mentioned countless times in this episode because those are legendary regularly. those are legendary for when they came out yeah and this one's just kind of been left behind i do think it's better than just being left behind but i do think it has been yeah. and i think in 20 years this isn't going to be heard of very much at all unless it has some weird resurgence and whatever the internet looks like that <laughs> at that point heck it's been 16 <laughs> years since i've seen this movie so yeah i know maybe in so, 20 years somebody else will point it out Right. So maybe it has a resurgence at some point in history and this looks really dumb, but I feel like it's a zero. Yeah. I I think that's a that's a fair thing to say, even though I could easily be swayed towards a one because of I I do think it did have that kind of prominence where not a lot of films that we've talked about would be given yeah. a zero. But yeah, yeah, I understand. It's that it's that thing where, yeah, like I said, I'm really just kind of forward thinking with this one because it's still recent enough that I, I don't want to take like the recency of our own, like not like what we And also let's be honest, we're bigger Jim Carrey fans than a lot of other people. Right, right. I feel like this movie, yeah, just isn't gonna have any the same kind of impact that a lot of his other movies have had. So yeah, a zero for impact on this one. I'll agree. But that puts our total at eight out of twenty. Um, like we said, mileage may vary. It's a comedy that's gonna be different for everybody pretty <laughs> definitively but according um, to our score this and pitch black are the same <laughs> <laughs> i like this better than pitch black personally but i enjoy this well, i, I like of, pitch black more than this personally yeah. so i think <laughs> there you go <laughs> i think we nailed it <laughs> but yeah um like we've said about comedy in the past like if comedy is like if it works for you literally none of the other categories matter no yeah. <laughs> so if if you are laughing throughout and i i laugh a decent amount at this film not it's not like i'm constantly laughing but i enjoy it even when i'm not laughing i'm enjoying what i'm watching i have a good time with it so i like this movie but i don't think it's a great film i think an eight out of ten is an appropriate score for it it might be too for late for this show. but put john michael higgins and more things hollywood please please for the love of god <laughs> i mean if you watch all of the uh um christopher guest films then you get quite a bit of him which true is <laughs> but yeah um that'll do it for the main discussion here and we're wrapping up the point points so eight out of 20 for us there but um we do have another movie for next week what are we watching 
We are going to be watching, and as I said at the end of last week's episode, I am going to be focusing on classics for the foreseeable future. I don't know how many weeks I'm going to pick classics. You're still going to pick whatever the heck you want to pick. So we'll still get a range of films, but I'm focusing mostly on pre-70s films. And the one decade that we haven't touched yet between the 30s and the 2020s Ah, the 40s. Yes, the 40s. So the film that I picked is just one that's just been on my watch list for forever. So I haven't seen it. And uh, but it's another comedy. And this is a Cary Grant led film, Arsenic and Old Lace. So that'll be what we watch next week. Very good. Absolutely. But yeah, that'll do it for this week on Great American Movie Review. Thank you for joining us. Once again, check us out on audio formats if you want to find us there, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you at the movies.